could, would you please um, just say and spell your name? All right. Uh, my name is Sean McNeil, Dr. Sean McNeil, S-H-A-W-N-M-C-N-E-I-L. Thank you, sir. And what type of medicine do you practice? Um, so I'm a medical doctor, an MD, but I practice adult psychiatry and child and adolescent psychiatry. So, sir, my big question is for you. With recently, we've had a lot of shootings here in Shreveport. We've had a lot of violent crimes, a lot of violent incidents that have happened. And for kids in particular, how can parents talk to their kids about violence, about what's going on, if, the, if their kids see a traumatizing incident? And also, what does this harm do for a kid's mindset growing up to be around such a violent area? Well, I think that trauma can bring a lot of insecurity for children. And when we're, when we're looking at what we want, what the ideal is for a child, we want as much security as possible. So, you know, being around a traumatic environment can be very distressing. And I think that parents need to know when it's time to get professional help. You know, and that can include seeing a psychiatrist or a psychologist or some other type of therapist. And uh, uh, typically the approach is, well, we don't want to re-traumatize the child. Uh, so we want to, you know, avoid having conversations that can induce that uh, distress and that can bring up the stress. And uh, I think that that's uh, very important for parents to realize that sometimes what they say could actually increase the stress depending on how it's approached. How can a parent talk to their child about violence where it wouldn't increase the stress and explain to them what happened? Well, um, I think that the parents need to keep in mind a few things. First of all, their child's developmental level. So not all children develop at the same rate. Some children are more capable of understanding what's happened and some children are really too young to, to fully process what's happened. So paying attention to your child's developmental level and having age appropriate discussions, trying to be as supportive as you can with those discussions, trying to foster a supportive environment at home where you know, the family is able to communicate where it's clear that the child is loved. I think those are both very important. Now for um, elementary kids, does violent crime um, cause a negative effect on elementary kids which can later cause them to participate in crimes? Does it, does it make them more likely when they're in a bad situation like that where they see stuff like that on a common basis? Does it leave like a longing effect on them and possibly even cause them to one day get caught up in some trouble like that? So there's not necessarily a, a straightforward cause and effect relationship, but child who, ex excuse me, children who experience adverse, um, adverse conditions while they're developing, um, they are at a predisposition for developing certain psychiatric problems and, and just having problems later on down the road. So in, in a way it can contribute, but you can't say for sure that it uh, would lead a person down that path. So what is something that a, um, let's say for a high schooler who's, who's watching tonight and a high schooler says they witnessed violent stuff and they might not feel comfortable talking about it. What are some strategies they can do to kind of ease the stress, ease the worry for them about what's going on? Okay, well, that's a great question. So uh, I think at the high school age, a lot of, a lot of these individuals, they are capable of uh, raising their voice when they do need help. And I think that, you know, parents should be very supportive in getting them that help. You know, there are clinics that they can go to where they can start having that discussion with a mental health professional. And uh, I think that's where it needs to start. If there's any question uh, about the long-term impact of something that a, a child or even a teenager has experienced, they probably should go to a professional to start that conversation. And Really, if I'm asked, let's say, even if they can't, let's say they can't get to a professional, let's say they don't have the money or the resources and they're just kind of by themselves. They don't have any um, real family, anything to help them. They just witness this on a daily basis. And let's say they have younger brothers and sisters and their mom or dad works two or three jobs and they're not home that much and that they're kind of raising their brother and sister as well and taking care of them. What can they do to kind of ease that stress? What can they, can they write stuff down? Can they note, can they come up? What can they do? Yeah, there are a lot of coping strategies that might be helpful for uh, you know, a child or an adolescent in that scenario. You're right, uh, journaling is definitely one that helps some people listening to music 
uh, really there, there are different things that calm us down. So I think everyone should seek out their own coping strategies as long as they're healthy. Um, of course, you know, it's always better to do that in the context of a therapeutic relationship with uh, a professional, but you know, I think that we can try to foster that type of uh, supportive environment, uh, you know, an environment where coping can happen, uh, you know, e even on an individual basis. Have you seen a lot of patients come to you with fears about after seeing a shooting or incidents of high violent violence recently or in, within the past year? Well, uh, not so much local violence. So I'll, I'll tell you about my background. Prior to March, I, I was uh, working at our local VA hospital and I was there for about two and a half years in the post-traumatic stress disorder clinic. And so I saw a lot of veterans who witnessed shootings. Um, of course, it's usually in the context of combat military operations. And, uh, and I can tell you that from treating them, there are a lot of things that we experience in our day-to-day -day life that might be triggers, the things that you might not expect. Uh, fireworks, a car backfiring, all of these can, uh, they can really send a person into a flashback, you know, where they re-experience some traumatic event. Like, for example, if they were in a shooting, anything that sounds loud might trigger their memories of that shooting. Yeah. And is there anything else you'd like to say about mental health for kids, adolescents, teens, uh, coping strategies, or anything that can help them when they witness a crime or a violent act, shooting, that can kind of ease that stress? Well, what I will say is that every child is different. And so I've seen some children that naturally have a lot of resilience, but we can't assume that every child has resilience. And so really anything that we can do to bolster that child's resilience, anything that a parent can do uh, to help their child get through tough situations. Um, but, you know, it, it should probably involve a professional once it gets to the point that the child is experiencing distress or, or nightmares or flashbacks. Doc, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. All right. You take care. All right. You too.